in forward ASEAN. So then uh, before moving to the, the, the actual program, I would like to give a brief introduction about what is uh, Think Tank 22 uh, Think Tank 2022 and the, the topic of our uh, today discussion. So the Think Tank 2022 um, actually established um, in order to promote peace uh, in the Asia Pacific region. And we actually support um, um, uh, for the uh, UPF or the Union of Peace Federations uh, uh, of the Republic of Korea based in Seoul. And the topic of the day discussion is about geopolitics on Korean Peninsula implication for Cambodia. As you know, Korean Peninsula is a mare by complex geopolitical competition among major stakeholders of the Asia Pacific, including the US, the uh, ROC, the North Korea, China, Russia, and Japan. And outside of the peninsula, extra regional stakeholder and actor play parts either through facilitation of dialogue and providing conflict resolution model. So uh, today's uh, lecture we will illuminate how the great power dynamics of the uh, Korean Peninsula and the role of um, the Southeast Asian country in peace process in the Korean Peninsula. So before uh, moving to our presentations by Dr. Ho Cho Ping, I would like to um, make a brief introduction about her background. So Dr. Ho Cho Ping is a senior lecturer at the Strategic Study and International Relations Program at the National University of Malaysia or UMK, uh, UKM. She is currently a co-founder and co-conventor of the um, East Asian International Relations Caucus at the National University of Malaysia. And she's also an adjunct lecturer at the Institute of Diplomacy and um, uh, Foreign Relations of the, and the Malaysian Armed Force Defense Colleges. And um, she, uh, her past affiliations and fellowship include um, Korean Foundations Fellow at the Institute of Strategic and International Study in Malaysia and at the U.S. Department of State as International Visited Le uh, Leadership Program. And she's also an academic of the uh, Korean study uh, in, 2020, uh, in 2011. So um, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Ho to make your presentation on geopolitics on the Korean Peninsula and implications to, for the ASEAN. Please, the floor is yours, Dr. Ho. Thank you so much uh, uh, to Asian Vision Institute and also Dr. Vanari Chiang uh, for inviting me to this uh, public lecture. It is a great honor. And uh, thank you so much, Ms. Him Sathya Roth, for your very kind introduction. So today I'm going to talk about um, geopolitics of uh, Korean Peninsula. So if I may be enabled to share slide, uh, that would be great. So, um, uh, so can the uh, Zoom uh, host uh, enable me to share slide? So, and I also want to mention, uh, I would like to express my thank to Dr. Uh, Ngo Sitikin for uh, managing uh, this uh, arrangement as well. So um, drug politics on the Korean Peninsula is seldom um, being uh, tied to the uh, ASEAN and Southeast Asia. So um, I would like to um, have an overview of geopolitics since the Korean, uh, Korean War because it affects how we are in this situation as of now. And I would bring to the ASEAN's relevance and what is our role uh, on the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. So firstly, the two Koreas uh, set up their own respective government at the end of World War II after um, they are liberated from Japan's colonization at the end of World War II. So the Republic of Korea uh, was established on 15 August on 1948 uh, in an election held by the United States while the DPRK or Democratic People's Republic of Korea or North Korea was established on 9th of September in the same year in a separate election held by the Soviet Union. So um, the re reunification uh, plan uh, was launched in 1950 
uh, in an attempt to um, uh, to reunify the Korean Peninsula as a result of inspiration that Kim Il Sung uh, uh, um, inspired by China's uh, revolutionary war against uh, between Chinese Communist Party and Kuomintang, um, and that was supported by the um, Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin rules at the time. So. Um, the war ravages um, um, both sides of Korean Peninsula as the United Nations Command was set up to, um, uh, to liberate Republic of Korea from the war or from the invasion. So at the time, many members of the United Nations at the time voted yes to evoke Chapter 7 of the United Nations for the first uh, UNC um, to assist um, um, member states uh, under distress. So when we look at this document and how it was being evolved, um, it is not, um, uh, <laughs> it is difficult not to think about the situation on the Russian invasion on um, uh, Ukraine right now. But as of now, I would just focus on the Korean Peninsula. So the causes uh, of how Russia and China was implicated on the Korean Peninsula has its roots in this um, involvement on the Korean War. So it was due to President Yeltsin's decision to open up a Soviet archive to South Korea that many of the historical documents was made known. So North Korean army was trained by the Soviet between 1946 until 1950. And at the time they have full control of North Korean army commands. While Kim Il-sung's plan was to um, uh, carry out an um, operation to overthrow the ROK government at the time. So they, um, the Soviet Union, China, and North Korea point to the United States speech um, uh, in 1950 that's kind of uh, uh, imply that South Korea was not within the perimeter, but he later uh, published his book to argue that uh, he actually did mean to protect South Korea um, by having uh, the military assistance uh, agreement signed in the same year as well. So uh, MacArthur, General MacArthur, who helped the United States to win the Pacific War against uh, Japan's uh, Imperial Army at the end of World War II, was uh, directly involved and commanded the uh, overturn of the progression of the Korean War at the time. So the U.S. involvement uh, resulting in uh, the phenomenon known as the Forgotten War, as the Vietnam War uh, captured the world's uh, attention, Korean Peninsula was uh, left forgotten. So this negative uh, legacy that no one has won the war has um, uh, uh, unconsciously making uh, the Korean issue uh, living in the subconscious of American policymakers' mind, but only uh, getting attention after the end of Cold War. So the basis for the United States to enter the war was because there were a military assistance agreement that is not known to North Korea and the Soviet Union at the time. And, uh, and this led to involvement of the US in the Korean War and thereby um, uh, this deeply rooted uh, causes of uh, the animosity on the Korean Peninsula has since uh, begun. So the progress of the Korean War also seen uh, the most nations, the most number of nations involved in the war. So it was not known as the Third World War because the battles are fought restricted on the Korean Peninsula. So how can we change the situation as of now? One of the proposal is to uh, have a peace agreement on the Korean Peninsula, but um, that was further complicated by the geopolitical uh, dimension. So as uh, we all know um, there are parties who signed the armistice agreement as shown in this photo at Pamunjom. However, uh, South Korea was missing from the uh, signatory. As you can see, uh, Kim Il-sung, Peng Dehuai of PRC and uh, General Clark from the United Nations Command uh, were signing uh, main signatories of the document. Um, as the president of the Republic of Korea at the time, uh, refused uh, to sign the agreement. So when Moon Jae-in uh, trying to promote a peace regime, um, the South Korea's uh, involvement was disputed by uh, China 
mainly and also by North Korea from time to time. So the substantive peace process began when Ronald Reagan uh, agreed to the uh, approach, uh, modest initiative to be launched towards North Korea as Soviet Union under Mikhail Gorbachev was trying to attempt reform and that led to dissolutions of Soviet Union to uh, Russian Federation. And Kim Il-sung at the time, uh, despite the uh, enmity with the South Korean government has been brought into the peace process as the, as the basis for um, the normalization of US DPRK relations. So this modest initiative was further um, substantiated in the form of the basic agreement 1991, when um, Prime Minister of North Korea was sent to Seoul to, send, uh, to sign the agreement on reconciliation non-aggression as, and as changes and cooperation between North and South Korea. So since then, the basic agreement of 1991 served as the basic document to underline the inter-Korean peace process. So whichever process uh, peace initiative has been launched, both North and South Korea will refer to this basic agreement as the foundation of their relations. So, um, the uh, United States uh, has also signed uh, the AGREE framework as the basis of cooperation to denuclearization of North Korea. Um, so that happened uh, a week after the passing of Kim Il-sung. So Kim Jong-il uh, at that time who succeeded the regime clearly showed support for the peace process by uh, having the agreement to go ahead. So this is Kang sok Ju the most trusted uh, aide to Kim Jong-il, uh, signing the agreement on behalf of DPRK with the main, main architect of the AGRI framework, uh, Robert Galushi, uh, who still uh, promotes the US, North Korea and inter-Korean peace process, uh, despite the uh, progress on the, um, uh, uh, the, com the further complicated process of nuclear and missile program. So, um, the, from the first nuclear crisis to the AGRI framework, the process detail in these three books shows that all parties, the major stakeholders, including the United States, South Korea, North Korea, uh, and uh, China, have the intention to ensure that the process is a success. So the four party consensus that um, uh, uh, also coincides with the setup of ASEAN Regional Forum in 1994 laid the foundation to the basis for um, ASEAN support for the uh, Korean Peninsula peace process. So after that, the next peace process only came when uh, Kim Dae-jong was elected as the president in 1998. He launched Sunshine Policy that led to the first inter-Korean summit in 2000 in Pyongyang. So his successor, Ro Mu Hyun, uh, also continued the same policy, uh, renamed it as policy of peace and prosperity, also meeting with Kim Jong-il in Pyongyang. So um, both um, Kim Dae-jung and also Ro Mu Hyun led to the establishment of Kaesong Industrial Complex and the Inter-Korean Liaison Office in, within the complex. So as you can see on the left, the shorter building is actually the Inter-Korean Liaison Office that acts as the de facto um, uh, embassy for the two Koreas. Um, and on the right is the main office for the Kaesong Industrial Complex of which has been ceased operation since um, 2020 when um, the Inter-Korean uh, Liaison Office has been uh, demolished. So the sign of peace has not been revived uh, since the pandemic. And uh, let us now look at what can be done uh, after the submit diplomacy. So six party talks was uh, uh, lauded as the most um, feasible multilateral uh, peace framework on the Korean Peninsula. The six party talks was initiated by China and it was seen as the most viable option to promote a solution between the major stakeholders on the Korean Peninsula. 
However, the each member trying to bring their own interests to the six party talks. And that was proven to be a very difficult process when North Korea uh, has been uh, threatened to withdraw from the progress. For example, when the Bush administration launched financial warfare on the regime for the first time, um, that led to uh, the first um, nuclear test by the North Korean regime in 2006. And after a brief uh, consensus reached in 2008, um, North Korea tested the second nuclear bomb in 2009 and announced their complete withdrawal from the six party talks process. So to persuade North Korea to denuclearize in return to A was a um, brinkmanship and bargaining uh, on the Korean Peninsula, which proved to be very difficult and marred with six different interests of the major stakeholders. So by this point, the national interest among the six parties has known as irreconcilable. Uh, and this is why Kim Jong-un has been excluding Japan um, uh, mostly out of the peace process with um, China, South Korea, and US um, and Russia playing a more minor role in trying to promote uh, a common consensus on the uh, Korean Peninsula. So ever since Kim Jong-il passed away unexpectedly in December 2011, Kim Jong-un resumed power and uh, failing deliberately Obama administration's late date agreement that was in a uh, negotiation process with Kim Jong-il before his passing. And the key China DPRK trade um, person was uh, executed and there was no engagement possible made during uh, between 2012 to 2017. However, during this same period, North Korea's relations with Southeast Asia and many other uh, third party nations who are non-major uh, stakeholders are increasing during this same time period. So which shows that there are promises in other area that is not uh, politically and security uh, related to North Korea. And uh, this is where we should explore the non-governmental or civil society aspect of the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. The summit diplomacy is the last time when the major stakeholders play a role. Um, when uh, Kim Jong-un finally decided to open up for a diplomatic engagement. And um, the first summit between the sitting leaders of US and DPRK uh, was made, uh, was uh, achieved between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. So um, there are a mismatch expectation between the different US governmental institutions, for example, the uh, CIA's uh, Department of Defense, Department of State, and also the White House. So to explore the cooperative uh, space um, on reaching an agreement on how to deal with North Korea, Trump actually reached out to China, and that led to the implementation of sanctions by China on North Korea for the first time in 2017, and that actually led to the situation known as the fire and furry, when North Korea is completely isolated without substantive support from its major partner. So what happened after that is that uh, they went through a difficult uh, negotiation after the Singapore summit. So um, Pompeo only get to meet Kim Jong-un after his third visit to Pyongyang in October, 2018. And right before that, there were three months of intense um, diplomacy between China and North Korea between March to June of 2018. So this coordination of uh, position between China and North Korea means that North Korea will never discount China's involvement in the Korean Peninsula. So whenever South Korea and the United States trying to promote any initiative or trying to um, start negotiation with North Korea without thinking about the leverage of China have over North Korea, that would be a mistake or coming from a wrong presumptions on where will North Korea get support from if the negotiation doesn't resulting in um, uh, any outcome. 
So the fifth inter-Korean summit or the third Moon Kim summit was held again in Pyongyang. So the Pyongyang Declaration reaffirmed commitment to ongoing reconciliation process that always uh, taking roots in the 1991 Basic Agreement and to also affirm the increase of non-governmental exchanges, especially on environmental. North Korea as a country actually suffers from uh, climate change uh, consequences in which it affected agriculture yield in the country and also uh, the scientific um, uh, knowledge that is needed to mitigate climate uh, uh, risk. So the implementation of other, other agreements such as military agreement to disarm or um, to demilitarize the DMZ uh, in the joint security area uh, was also underway in 2018. So Moon's, um, Moon Jae-in's uh, strong uh, proposition in USDPRK negotiation also played a role in the peace process in that year. Um, the military organization uh, cooperation in the DMZ area is to remove the mines uh, along the DMZ. As of now, it was only the South Korean side that continued the operation and that doesn't uh, receive any um, objection from the North Korean side, even though North Korean army no longer uh, cooperate alongside with South Korean army at the moment as we speak. So the inter-Korean engagement and reconciliation is very important uh, based on uh, several uh, stakeholders' preposition. Firstly is the sanctions coming from the United States and U UN uh, Sanctions Committee. Secondly, coming from Russia, China, North Korea, tripartite coordination. And thirdly, uh, South Korea's governmental position was restricted by the sanctions regime and also um, the uh, relentless attempt to try to reach out to North Korea. So for many other stakeholders for South Korea, now that we know uh, Yoon suk nyeol would be the incoming new uh, presidential uh, um, uh, candidate uh, on the Korean Peninsula. So what he laid out in terms of economic security and civil society prospect between North and South Korea would be crucial, whether there will be continuity for, from the Moon administration or not. And uh, for the United States, whether Biden administration would come to terms to a uh, no precondition uh, negotiation, whether it is possible to uh, prioritize public health cooperation rather than a denuclearization talk. And as for China, the continued support uh, to North Korea in the post-pandemic uh, condition is already being expected. And as for ASEAN, whether we wish to enhance our leverage as a mediator, as a neutral third party between the two Koreas, and whether we wanted to extend our civil society engagement with North Korea, if North Korea is opening up for international engagement. So ASEAN's uh, play a role uh, when we supported to include DPRKs the first nuclear crisis agenda in 1994 when we first convened ASEAN Regional Forum. Secondly, is when Dr. Surin Pitsuwan, our former Secretary General of ASEAN, invited North Korea to be a member of ASEAN Regional Forum in 2001. And finally, um, DPRK uh, appointed an ambassador to North ASEAN uh, since 2011. So as of now, ASEAN Regional Forum remain the only forum where DPRK is represented uh, in the governmental uh, level capacity. However, ASEAN's position has been implicated since 2016 when US launched uh, sanctions on North Korea and also due to North Korea's own missile testing that we need to issue uh, uh, statements of condemnation and um, US maximum pressure campaign since the Trump administration is still in effect uh, until today. So this led to ASEAN's withdrawn political will to extend our promotion of um, peaceful relations on the Korean Peninsula as we need to revert to our domestic position on Mekong, South China Sea, 
and also on the ASEAN post-pandemic recovery as of now. So is it feasible to expect ASEAN to continue to involve on the Korean Peninsula? So in the book project um, that I work with ISIS Malaysia that was launched in 2020, there are at least two book chapter by Dr. Nguyen T. Big Nok and also Dr. Uh, Professor Aris Aruge from the Philippines that look at whether there is synergy between South Korea and ASEAN to promote engagement on North Korea and also whether ASEAN is able to transform in security on the Korean Peninsula and involve itself directly on the Korean Peninsula. So firstly, we all 10 member states have bilateral relations with both North and South Korea, now minus Malaysia as situation has changed uh, over the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there are convergence of ASEAN community vision with the peace pillar of South Korea mm -hmm. on the outlook on the Korean Peninsula. So if the current, uh, the incoming Yoon Suk Nyeol administration don't change the peace approach on the Korean Peninsula, there is still hope for this convergence of the vision and approach. Thirdly, is to maximize ASEAN member states' roles as stakeholders. We are not a bystander or an extra regional actor. We are actually able, credible, and to engage developments with both South and North Korea credibly. So in the words of Professor Aris Aruge, ASEAN would pursue continuous engagement with both North and South Korea and would always choose the cause of peace on the Korean Peninsula. So it is very true that it is evidence ASEAN always respond clearly and fully to South Korea's peace initiative. So uh, in addition to that, our track two network, ASEAN ISIS network, has involved um, in the ASEAN ISIS member representative, participants from both DPRK and NROK in a round table on the Korean Peninsula uh, take place in Yangon, Myanmar in December 2018, when we discussed very openly about what is the prospect of US North Korea submit diplomacy after Singapore and to be taken place in Hanoi and uh, North Korea's real concern and how South Korea and ASEAN members can mitigate such concerns. So as doc Dr. Nguyen uh, Big Nok also uh, mentioned in her book chapter, the strategic vision and practical approach would be very helpful to promote concrete cooperation and continue to have dialogues between all parties. So as right now, we are still characterized by high level of strategic uncertainty. We need honest broker like ASEAN to promote the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. So other practical area where Southeast Asian organization, especially non-governmental ones, uh, is an example of chosen exchange. So it is an NGO from Singapore that promote educational exchanges between DPRK and other uh, institutions to teach uh, um, entrepreneurship to North Korea and to uh, promote digital uh, exchanges over the pandemic area. So as North Korea uh, 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 imposed a very strict lockdown uh, in on its country over the pandemic, digital exchanges and online lecture series has been held from 2020 to 2021, uh, over two years time. So this year, I'm, I'm not sure whether they have new program, but as of last year, they do have online sessions held between Singapore, Vietnam, and North Korea. Um, not about nuclear or missiles or things like that, but about real educational exchanges and how to continue to promote entrepreneurship and educational level exchanges of uh, North Korean people inside North Korea. So there are many advantages from ASEAN civil society. Another example is Mercy Malaysia. In 2004, when there was a train collision strategy occurred in uh, North Korea, very near to China border. After China um, um, counterpart came to clean up and went back to China, it was Malaysian NGO, a medical assistant NGO that came to North Korea, trying to uh, assess the situation 
in North Korean uh, province and uh, North Korean government openly invites um, Malaysian medical NGO to provide um, uh, optometric surgical operation and also other medical health assistance to North Korean population during that time. So since then, um, Malaysian Mercy Malaysia um, has been involved in medical uh, operations to North Korea uh, from 2004 until 2011 or 2012. So the conclusion that I can make here is that there are existing knots of network, whether it is agricultural, medical assistance or educational um, cooperation that has been established between ASEAN member states governmental and non-governmental organization uh, with North Korea. And there are historical linkages that put ASEAN in the best position as a third party to promote the peace process on the Korean Peninsula. But we cannot look away from the main obstacles. Firstly, is what I mentioned before, ASEAN member states diminishing well will to include Korean Peninsula as part of the ASEAN Political Security Committee agenda. So if Cambodia as the ASEAN chair, can uh, prompt the possibility of um, including Korean Peninsula as part of ASEAN Political Security Committee agenda, that would be the ideal first step to start jumpstart the uh, uh, peace promotion agenda. Secondly, is uh, South Korea's in the past inconsistent uh, long-term strategy on the Korean Peninsula. So to assure other stakeholders to promote peace initiative on the Korean Peninsula, South Korea has to reach a bipartisan consensus on how to pursue a long-term strategy that does not swing between the two extremes uh, on how are they going to deal with North Korea. Thirdly, we are yet to see any indicator from North Korea that they will uh, adopt an open uh, strategy opening up the country as they have not uh, received any form of vaccination nationwide. So that would prove to be difficult for in-person uh, peace process implementation. But as the case of Chosun exchange show, digital exchange is possible and whether it would be able to extend it to other areas. So for the United States, they also fluctuates between diplomatic and confrontational approach on the Korean Peninsula, especially towards North Korea. So ASEAN need to rethink whether we can extend our peace posture beyond Mekong and South China Sea. So with that, um, I end my uh, public lecture on the geopolitics and the peace um, possibility between ASEAN and the Korean Peninsula. Thank you so much for your time. So thank you, Dr. Ho, for the very brief and very, I mean, I mean, very descriptive presentations on the Korean Peninsula issues and your recommendation. It was very nice, and um, 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 you know, um, uh, the I believe that your recommendation is um, practical. But um, then I would like to um, make a clarification because you said that um, the on the case of Korean Peninsula, the um, the role of ASEAN should be maximized, then how could the ASEAN or the external partner have to maximize the role of ASEAN? And do you believe that the North Korea will actually a, um, agree on I mean, uh, the expansions of the role of ASEAN in Korean Peninsula? Um, thank you for that very sharp question. So uh, in the past, uh, as I said, during the void of the engagement, by North Korea towards South Korea, United States, and all that, right, from 2012 to 2017. So that shows the periods of the rise of exchanges between North Korea and Southeast Asia. There are bilateral trade data to prove it. So Thailand and even Philippines has increased their export and import uh, to and from North Korea. So in agricultural material, raw material, machinery tools, etc. So um, there is also the time when the Southeast Asian NGO is able to establish some groundwork uh, with the approval from the North Korean government. So that period shows that there is a practicality and the intention of North Korea to accept non-major stakeholders engagement. So it's just that after the summit diplomacy and also the pandemic 
has kind of uh, closed down many of those possibility. So when North Korea continue to um, uh, <laughs> to reject uh, uh, the resumptions of negotiation with US and even South Korea, uh, Chosun Exchange, a Singaporean NGO, is still being engage so they are able to open online public lecture uh, with North Korean counterparts and all that of which even South Korea is not able to do so with that um, evidence I think that uh, North Korea would be still open maybe not in person but online exchanges if any if we intend to extend that to to them Okay, so thank you, Dr. Ho. Uh, what about, like, um, you said that because nowadays the South Korea or the Republic of Korea have an uh, inconsistency, uh, inconsistencies of the long-term strategy in the Korean Peninsula. So what should be the recommended long-term strategy for the Korean Peninsula that actually should be implemented by the, 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 the South Korea? So um, South Korean politics has increasingly polarized in the recent years. So um, the most recent uh, presidential election also saw a very thin margin of 0.7. So never have we seen such a, a close competition between two uh, very different uh, political uh, uh, ideology um, contested um, between the two. So, and they have very different approach on North Korea. So if the liberal wins, they are going to continue to promote exchanges with North Korea. When the conservative win, they may try to reach out to North Korea, but North Korea would assume that they are going to work very closely with the US military and therefore give rise to security dilemma to North Korea. So they would be reluctant to work with a conservative government in South Korea. So for the South Korean government, regardless of the change of the presidency and the political parties, they should have a bipartisan consensus at the National Assembly uh, uh, at, uh, level where both parties are represented and the lawmakers in the National Assembly should agree on the set of principles on how to engage North Korea, the basic fundamental principle and for that, they can go back to the basic agreement of 1991 to start drafting their bipartisan consensus on how to deal with North Korea for the long term. Okay, so thank you, um, Dr. Ho. So um, what about the role of the UPF? Uh, it seems like actually the Universal Peace Federation has played an important role in, you know, trying to, you know, their aim is actually try to, um, like, uh, yeah, okay, uh, between the two states. So uh, uh, what should be, I mean, uh, the next step for the Universal Peace Federation in, in order to, like, you know, um, um, trying to um, I mean, implement their agenda more effectively in order, you know, to solve the problem between these two states? I think that uh, uh, from my observation, I think if I'm not mistaken, the Universal Peace Federation has been reached out to mainly uh, civil organization. They also try to convince the governmental stakeholders in uh, believing and investing in Korean peace process. Um, however, they always reach out to the major stakeholders like uh, the United States, um, <laughs> Japan, and also uh, European countries. However, um, these are the um, countries or regional organization have the least connection to North Korea in terms of non-critical period of engagement. So if Universal Peace Federation uh, uh, see the potential in ASEAN, in ASEAN uh, Track 2 Network, for example, actually more can be done when we look out to a third party country or organization like ASEAN or its member states to jumpstart, to provide a kind of a neutral platform where the two Koreas would be comfortable to come together and to talk about their mutual concerns. For example, as I said, there was already a DPRK ambassador to ASEAN at the ASEAN Secretariat, which means that Indonesia, for example, at the ASEAN Secretariat level can actually convene a kind of a dialogue for the peace process on the Korean Peninsula from the ASEAN standpoint. So we are not taking side, we are neutral, we are non-aligned. So we provide a kind of a best and safe um, space for the 
countries in dispute to express their concern and trying to reach a conclusion on how to take things forward from them. So oh, thank you for the very you know uh, fruitful um, you know idea about um, the, the the recommendation on, uh, for the UPF. So uh, doctor, among the ten country, let's say now uh, Myanmar has actually been um, you know keep uh, on hold for a while. So among the nine country in the ASEAN, who should be you know um, the best? actor in order to solve the ammo or negotiate between the two countries. Yeah, thank you for um, also raising this very important question. Firstly, I think would be Indonesia because of their position as the ASEAN Secretariat headquarters. Secondly, is the um, their bilateral relations with DPRK goes back to when uh, during the Kim Il Sung time as well. So both uh, family both regime have that long family ties that maintain uh, 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 the exchanges. And until today, there are still formidable actors within Indonesia that can actually visit North Korea if they wish to. And Indonesia embassy in Pyongyang is among the last one <laughs> to uh, uh, retreat from Pyongyang back to uh, home country. Secondly would be um, Vietnam and Thailand. So uh, Vietnam has the longest relations uh, out of Southeast Asia because of their communist ties. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, because Vietnam has obviously uh, putting a lot of emphasis on their relations with South Korea because of economic uh, reasons. So uh, North Korea increasingly have less trust on <laughs> Vietnam, but still the political exchanges is the strongest between these two. So why Thailand? Because uh, Thailand has one of the biggest group on studying uh, <laughs> Juche, DPRK Friendship Association. So when um, um, there are um, contingency happening involving North Korea and Southeast Asia, Thailand is always the one that's trying to promote alternative solution. So the former Secretary General of ASEAN, Surin Pitsuwan, he is from Thailand. So he is the one that promote active Thailand's role in promoting peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Also because Thailand together with Philippines are the only two Southeast Asian countries involved in the Korean War. So they wish to see peace a treaty at least to be established, a kind of a peace regime to be established on the Korean Peninsula. So um, they have very good uh, historical linkages and also reason to see the resolution of the Korean problem. So thereby they are, they can be the most trusted Southeast Asian actors on the Korean Peninsula. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Chu. Um, so uh, what about um, Cambodia? I'm not gonna ask uh, uh, why Cambodia is not actually one um, one of the prioritized state to be um, um, the negotiator between the two states. But uh, you know, uh, what should be uh, what should Cambodia dance? Because today, I mean, this year we actually um, 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 hold our ASEAN Championship for 2022, and you know we have uh, many issues such as like the Russia Ukraine issue, Myanmar issue, but. We have um, actually, I believe that um, Cambodia will um, forgot, uh, will not forget um, the Korean Peninsula issue. So, what should Cambodia do in order to raise this issue and probably um, like uh, find some of the solution or a good, um, a better progress in Korean Peninsula? I think uh, if we go back to the historical time again, uh, your late uh, king, uh, Norodong Singhano. Uh, is a good friend of uh, Kim Il-sung as well. And Kim Il-sung actually provided uh, a castle <laughs> in uh, North Korea when uh, uh, a late king, uh, Norodong Sihano, need a shelter uh, during your country's very difficult transition time. So, and this actually should be one of the pillar of which why the current uh, Cambodian government should consider how to play a more active role in terms of promoting a peace initiative on the Korean Peninsula. So the current um, Cambodia-North Korea relations was restricted due to the sanctions regime. 
So just like in Malaysia as well, and also Singapore. So I didn't mention other countries because we are all affected by the sanctions regime. So that's why we kind of reduce uh, interaction, especially in uh, economic ties with North Korea. So um, uh, we don't try to challenge the sanctions regime, but we should promote the humanitarian approach to North Korea. So for example, uh, the post-pandemic uh, issue would be public health infrastructure. So if um, US and United Nations committee continue to sanctions uh, the provision where medical uh, equipment cannot be delivered to North Korea, so that would uh, tarnish the intention in terms of humanitarian assistance to North Korea. So um, Pyongyang General Hospital was actually near completion when the maximum pressure campaign was launched. So because of that maximum pressure, a lot of the medical equipment cannot be sent to North Korea. So that actually harmed North Korea's capability to handle the uh, pandemic situation, uh, we, we suspect. So if um, anything, Cambodia with its ASEAN chairmanship can consider to include Korean Peninsula Peace Agenda as part of ASEAN Political Security Community. So our ASEAN Political Security Community is the thinnest document out of economy and also social cultural community. So our political security blueprint can be extended to the entire East Asia. So that will allow us to include not only Mekong uh, um, Basin, South China Sea, but also to consider the wider East Asia peace and stability progress. So um, uh, as DPRK is part of the ASEAN Regional Forum member, so that actually accorded them a status or uh, a worthy agenda in our <laughs> discussion. But again, as I mentioned in my presentation just now, um, the political will to include Korean Peninsula in ASEAN submit agenda is a difficult one. So that will require intra-ASEAN um, dialogue and consensus before that can become a reality. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Dr. Tuo. Another question, is, which is actually um, just happened uh, recently, not, not really recently, but two, uh, two months ago, right? So um, it's referred to the proposal of our I mean, uh, Cambodia Prime Minister, um, Sunday Dicho Prime Minister uh, at the World Summit uh, on Korean Peninsula that actually organized by the UPS. He proposed the two state toward one nation's proposal. Then um, for your recommendation, how should we, Cambodia or actually um, the ASEAN should do in order to realize this such vision? I mean, the two state toward one nation vision? Uh, yeah, so I am very glad to hear about this. So I will surely check out this uh, speech by your prime minister later. So the two state uh, and one Korean Federation solution has been proposed during the Kim Il-sung time as well. So the peace process uh, was actually started during Park Chung-hee. So even though he is a, <laughs> a military detector in South Korea, but he does have the intention to resolve this problem. However, unfortunately, uh, because of the assassination attempt on Park Chung-hee <laughs> and his wife, his family members, so that's why the, the discussion on Korean Confederation uh, could not proceed. So um, going back to the basic agreement of 1991, so non-aggression, so both DPRK and ROK should not harm each other so, or attack each other in any way, non-violence. So after that consensus has still been confirmed and achieved, then they can talk about a future unification uh, scenario where North-South Korean people can travel somewhat freely <laughs> to one another. So the, the problem is who should be known as the head of state? Are they going to be the two head of state? Because uh, the political system is so different, drastically different. So how can that be allowed to happen <laughs> if you uh, wanted to reach uh, one confederation? So uh, ASEAN or Cambodia, can actually try to reconvene the Roundtable on Korean Peninsula Dialogue 
that used to take place in December 2018. So I was there representing uh, ISIS Malaysia, where the we, we sit alongside with North Korean and also South Korean people. So that atmosphere, without any American representation, without Chinese, without Japanese. So it's only ASEAN members and the two Korea. So the discussion took place was very frank, very open. So North Korean can express directly what are their main concerns. We listen and we really discuss. So South Korea, what do you think about this? This is North Korea's main concern. And can you mitigate such a dilemma? So that kind of open discussion should take place first, maybe at the track two level, when it was mature enough to have a kind of a framework to start talking about a um, federation or confederation between the two Korea, then it can be escalated to track 1.5, of which ASEAN is also very familiar with. Then we can let the two Korea um, have that discussion among themselves if they think there is no longer the need for ASEAN to continue to involve in that. What we can do is really to provide a neutral platform, a safe space for them to talk about such sensitive issues without foreign intervention. So I think that is the best guarantee that we can give to the two Koreas. So uh, this is an interesting activity. And also I, I believe that you said that uh, you have a very frank and open discussion during that event. So may I know what is the outcome of uh, like the, the of, of, of that discussion? Uh, North Korea delegation at that time was represented by the Institute of Peace and Disarmament, so their think tank. Um, the, the director general of the think tank and three researchers participate in the discussion. So firstly, uh, because that was a um, few months before the Hanoi summit, so they talk about how to remove uh, sanctions. So the sanctions, partial sanctions relief as part of the package deal to, for North Korea to allow the United States to visit North Korea for denuclearization inspection. So we can see the, uh, we can sense the sincerity from the Kim Jong-un regime at the time for the uh, simultaneous uh, give and take uh, uh, deal <laughs> negotiation at the time. However, as we all know, uh, Trump actually walked away from the Hanoi summit that left the DPRK delegation in Hanoi in shock. So shocked, they have to convene a midnight <laughs> conference, press conference, to clarify some of the things that they claim that was not what they said during the meeting with the US delegation. <laughs> so uh, from these uh, details, we actually know that they are quite transparent, they can be transparent. So just like the uh, a Singaporean NGO uh, exchange with North Korea. So they put it on their website, right? So there's nothing to hide. And what they talk about, they also share, right? Even the screen capture. So um, we need to trust at a certain level of their, uh, what they share with us sincerely. So outside of the nuclear and uh, missiles uh, development program, because when non-security aspect is not taken care of, it is difficult to secure this uh, high security level of consensus. So I think for major stakeholders like United States, um, South Korea, for example, they need to establish that kind of uh, communication if there is no will to express or to take each other seriously, for example, to take North Korea seriously, then there is no uh, basis to jumpstart a kind of a, a very sensitive com conversation. Okay, so thank you, Dr. So, so, you know, um, in a negotiation, as you said, that there should be a package deal, and then there should be someone who give an offer first. But uh, from what um, actually notified throughout like the whole negotiations like um, um, uh, related to the Korean Peninsula, um, uh, I don't see no one is act, I mean, uh, actually, um, I mean, um, try to make an offer first. They actually the one who want to get an offer first. So do you think that should the external partner like um, the US and, um, and ASEAN or something, give a little incentive of uh, offer the first um, negotiate I mean, uh, deal to uh, the North Korea so that the North Korea could 
sees our sincerity and give us some offer back? Or should we wait until the North Korea give us an offer? So there is a process known as the signaling of messages. And I think the United States often dismiss those signaling. <laughs> so uh, what happened before was that uh, North Korea has been consistently trying to say that we are open up to talk, but first, uh, this criteria must be met. Um, but when United States dismissed those signals due to their concerns about nuclear programs, missile programs, and there is a precondition before they can start talking about other issues, so this has um, uh, uh, created a kind of a scenario, a deadlock scenario, <laughs> where no one wants to start talking or offering anything. So given the betrayal that North Korea experienced in the Hanoi summit, it is unlikely that North Korea is going to um, going back to the same offer that it has before because the um, leverage is now much higher <laughs> because you used to betray that trust of having an open dialogue discussion and the deal, right? But uh, as the United States can walk away anytime, <laughs> so how can you assure North Korea to restart negotiation again? So this is one. Secondly, is uh, South Korea need to ensure uh, North Korea trust them as well. So this is why I said at the National Assembly level, domestic politics, South Korea need to come up with a consistent long-term approach on the Korean Peninsula. Otherwise, North Korea would not trust South Korea enough to, for them to come up with an initiative only to be uh, withdrawn after five years when another president come into place. So, so consistency is key. And we know that uh, North Korean leadership can last for a very long time. <laughs> they remain in the same family and the regime elites are uh, <laughs> transitioning uh, just within that very few uh, families. So um, uh, with that in mind, US, South Korea and ASEAN uh, need to think about that long-term approach. I think ASEAN as a long-term regional organization, we are not going to go away anytime soon. So we can actually provide that long-term possibility of a platform to provide to the two Koreas to come together and talk their differences. So uh, if only they accept that ASEAN can be that neutral platform. So that I hope um, um, both Korea can keep that in mind. So whenever they feel that the time is right, uh, ASEAN is always for uh, there for them. Okay. So I think I have a uh, one more question. I'm sorry for the too many questions, no um, Dr. Ho. So, from your perspective, what should be the next move or the next step that actually deployed by the North Korea? Um, so as of now, North Korea is the only country that doesn't have a full vaccination program. So the latest update from the World Health Organization is that they keep rejecting the shipment or acceptance of the vaccine. So I hope that uh, they can uh, open up to accept the vaccination program. Uh, otherwise, uh, it would be difficult diplomatically, politically, and uh, in terms of their presence in international organizations such as at the United Nations, all of their foreign missions overseas never come home <laughs> since the pandemic outbreak. So this means that it is not sustainable to have your people residing in other country for so long. <laughs> like this is not forever, right? So they need to rethink about their public health infrastructure. So if they can uh, set up condition that is viable for the outside governmental or non-governmental organization to provide medical health assistance. That would be ideal, the first step. And actually through the satellite imagery, the um, main ports and train station have already set up this infection facility. So meaning that they are actually well equipped, but maybe the equipment is not enough. So we need to uh, ask them if they need more of that and we can provide as well. So not only government, but also medical health organization, Doctors Without Borders, Food and Agriculture Organization should be allowed to assess their needs. And North Korea should be uh, open about that. And they can eventually slowly allowing themselves a gradual acceptance. 
because no country should rely on other big power for a very long time. Uh, so if North Korea continue to rely only on China uh, after the pandemic scenario, that is not ideal. The country, no matter how small, should have their own agency in deciding their um, diplomatic outreach, not just on one country, but North Korea still remain as part of the international communities member, like in UN or in ASEAN Regional Forum. Okay. So, yep, doctor. Um, then uh, I'm sorry, I have another question. So uh, in, uh, in ASEAN, we have one center, the AHA Center, that mm -hmm. is actually dealing with uh, disaster management and some humanitarian assistance uh, operations. And I've, I know that um, the, the AHA Center have actually been very active in uh, the humanitarian operation in Myanmar. So do you think um, the, like, uh, the AHA Center of the ASEAN are actually able to you know, um, um, uh, implement this kind of humanitarian operation in the North Korea? From like, for example, do you believe that like the perspective of the North Korean leader actually allow ASEAN to implement this, such um, operation? Okay, so that is very, very interesting. So uh, what comes out on my head is that um, AHA Center's primary focus is to deliver disaster relief uh, assistance to all ASEAN member countries. So AHA Center welcome partnership. So for example, Japan uh, can provide uh, aid or assistance, uh, capacity uh, building and training of uh, AHA Center's uh, uh, members. So we are now struggling to deliver substantive aid to Myanmar. They have delivered so far twice, or maybe there are more, I don't know. But um, uh, first two assistance to Myanmar has already been delivered. But uh, we also have other scenario like uh, the typhoon in the Philippines and when Laos have that uh, landslide uh, incidents. So um, when other stakeholders like um, uh, ASEAN dialogue partners US, China, Japan, South Korea, when they can work together with AHA Center within the ASEAN region, only when that partnership has reached to the extent that we can operate uh, quite independently, only then we can widen the scope to outside of ASEAN region because we lack resources and uh, mobilization under the post-pandemic era is quite restricted. So yeah, whether North Korea can accept or not is another issue. <laughs> and uh, firstly is we must be able to take care of ourselves first before we can extend help to outside of our own region. But that is a, indeed a very good idea. No, because like uh, sometimes when we deal with the political issue and it's uh, become deadlock or there's no move at all, humanitarian <laughs> operation or humanitarian assistance can be one of the key to unlock this problem. At least we can That's open right. a little door for the, to the problem. So um, thank you, uh, Dr. Ho Chiu Bing. I, I think uh, I have no more question and I believe uh, um, this is the most, um, you know, uh, uh, um, interactive and frank and open discussion and we we actually open it uh, like to the public so yeah. that they, they they know what should um, your perspective on how uh, we build peace in the Korean Peninsula so um, Dr. Cho um, do you have any uh, I mean a conclusion or final words to say to our audience who oh, actually thanks. yeah yeah thank you so much so uh, I hope within ASEAN we can seriously consider how to be the example and model of the peace process ourselves. So be it uh, whether so during uh, Cambodia's uh, and every country's uh, ASEAN chairmanship, we need to demonstrate our capability to do well within our own region, thereby we can be a credible partner for other peace process uh, outside of our region. So thank you so much, Evi, for inviting me. And thank you so much, Ms. Kim Sotiros, for your very able moderation and questions. 
So thank you, Dr. Ho Chi Ping, for your you know insightful and very uh, practical idea on how to build peace in this region, um, in the Korean Peninsula, and some you know recommendation that actually can be implemented in the uh, ASEAN region as well, and especially uh, to the case of Myanmar. And uh, I believe that this uh, public lecture have actually been heard by you know uh, some people actually in the government or uh, in the policy making level, and I hope. So this recommendation should be considered. Uh, and I know that yes, Cambodia this year actually have a very big burden because we are the chair of the ASEAN this year and we have like at least three important issues to deal with. But I believe that and I hope that the case of Korean Peninsula can also be one of the priority issue in the regional and peace and, you know, um, an international issue um, that actually uh, should be discussed among the ASEAN member states. And thank you, thank you, um, Dr. Uh, thank you so, much. Boy. <laughs> so for your contribution today and your participation today. And thank you everyone who actually watches online uh, via Facebook. Thank you. And then I would like to announce that this is the end of our public lecture and see you in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.